Greetings, everyone. Welcome to the African Exodus Show. I'm your host, Tony Cherie, here to you with a new video. Before we get started, I want to remind you all, if you have not already, but you want to stay connected in a community outside of Rumble and YouTube, you can add yourself to my Telegram channel. There I post any time that I post a video or if there's any thoughts that I want to share with the people. In addition, if you want to support this channel, you can do so on my Patreon. My Patreon is where I post an exclusive video just for you. So today we're going to talk more about this subject within the segment, Come Out of Christianity. We're going to talk more about the beginning stages of Christianity and ask the specific question, what's wrong with Christianity? You all know, you should know by now that I am absolutely a believer in Yahushua HaMashiach, that he is the son of Elohim, God in the flesh, all of these things. I have been very clear that that's my belief. So when I tell you that there's a problem with Christianity, what am I saying? Isn't that what I am? Aren't I a follower of Christianity? The point, importance of differentiating these, the, the one of the Bible and the one of the modern world is because you will see very early on that there was a co-optation of the message and of the belief that has had a really detrimental effect to this day. When you look at these scandals that are happening, whether it's the TV Joshua scandal or or even I did a report on a cult inside of Kenya where hundreds of children and women and men were killed within this cult. All of these things are because of a foundational issue. Now, it's not that all of Christianity deals with this, these types of killings or these types of egregious acts, but certainly the foundation of it leads to an idea that lawlessness is permitted. And so many people will turn a blind eye when they see things that are not scripturally rooted, that do not reflect the message of Yahusha. So turn a blind eye because they think that, well, this is the way that it is. This is how the faith is practiced. So we're not even going to question these people who we deem of authority. So the question is, when did it change? Now, I've said before on this channel, I want to say again, you have to learn to differentiate Christianity from the way. The way is what the followers of Yahushua call themselves. They said we practice the way. Christianity does not even exist in the time of the Bible. The term Christianity, and we're going to go to when the term was actually applied to the faith, did not come until uh, decades after the Bible canon was, or canon was closed, according to most commonly accepted beliefs on when the canon ended. So if this belief or this term came way after, what was attached to it? What was attached to this idea that we have a separate idea, identity, separate from Yasharal, separate from Israel, separate from being people who come from the traditions passed down from Mosaic law? What is this idea that we are of a new tradition and this new tradition is going to overtake Take what has already been done as a foundation set by Yahuwah. Yahuwah set the foundation inside of the Old Testament. So to do away with it, why would we want to do away with something that Yahuwah set as a foundation? So we're going to get into all of that inside of this presentation. And first, we're actually going to start in a place where you might not think we would start. It's Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He actually did a really good essay. I encourage you to read the whole thing. I will post it to my Patreon. But a really good essay that he wrote on how Christianity arose out of the Roman Empire and what was happening at the time when it arose. We spoke last week about the mystery religions. The reason I wanted to set that foundation is so that this week we could talk about what happened with these mystery religions and how did it infiltrate the Christian faith? How did it take over? So with no further ado, let's get started with that article. The name of the essay, rather, is The Influence of Mystic Religions on Christianity. As I said, this was written by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That's not why I chose it, though. It's actually a really good description and breakdown of what I'm trying to get everyone to understand and realize. So he wrote this in 1949. I believe it was when he was doing his doctoral, um, Crozer Theological Seminary. So Dr. King wasn't even a Dr. King that we know of him as today, but he wrote a really good article, and that's why I wanted to read this to you. So let's get into it. The Greco-Roman world in which the early church developed was one of diverse religions. The conditions of that era made it possible for these religions to sweep like a tidal wave over the ancient world. 
The people of that age were eager and zealous in their search for religious experience. The existence of this atmosphere was vitally important in the development and eventual triumph of Christianity. These many religions known as mystery religions were not alike in every respect. To draw this conclusion would lead to gratuitous and erroneous supposition. They covered an enormous range and manifested a great diversity in character and outlook from Orphicism to Gnosticism, from the orgies of the Kabira to the fervors of the Hermetic Contemplative. However, it should be noticed that these mysteries possessed many fundamental likenesses. Number one, all held that the initiate shared in symbolic sacramental fashion the experience of the God. Number two, all had secret rites for the initiated. And number three, all offered mystical cleansing from sin. Number four, all promised a happy future for the faithful. Christianity triumphed over these mystery religions after long conflict. Their triumph may be attributed in part to the fact that Christianity took from its opponents their own weapons and used them. The better elements of the mystery religions were transferred to the new religion. As the religious history of the empire is studied more closely, writes Cumont, the triumph of the church will, in our opinion, appear more and more as a culmination of a long evolution and its pearl superstitions, if we know the moral antecedents of the world in which it developed. The victory of Christianity in the Roman Empire is another example of the universal historical law that the culture which conquers is then in turn conquered. I want to say that again. The culture which conquers is in turn conquered. The universal law is especially true of religion. It is inevitable when a new religion comes to exist side by side with a group of religions from which it's continually detaching members, introducing them into its own midst with the patience of their original religions impressed upon their minds, that this new religion should tend to assimilate with the assimilation of the members some of the elements of these existing religions. The more crusading a religion is, the more it absorbs. Certainly, Christianity has been a crusading religion from the beginning. It is because of this crusading spirit and its superb power of adaptability that Christianity has been able to survive. Dr. Kane then goes into describing a number of other mystery religions. We're going to talk about one particular mystery religion. And I encourage you all, just in general, study the mystery religions because you'll see a lot of similarities that have Inf infiltrated many of our thought beliefs, not just in Christianity, but Western society in general. But we're going to focus on one, Mithraism. Mithraism, because it is the mystery religion that dominated the Roman Empire at the time when Christianity then took over and became the official religion. So let's read about Mithraism. Mithraism is perhaps the greatest example of paganism's last effort to reconcile itself to the great spiritual movement, which was gaining such sturdy influence with its pure conception of God. Ernest Renan, the French philosopher and Orientalist, expressed the opinion that Mithraism would have been the religion of the modern world if anything had occurred to halt or destroy the growth of Christianity in the early centuries of its existence. All this goes to show how important Mithraism was in ancient times. It was suppressed by the Christian sometime in the later part of the fourth century, but its collapse seems to have been due to the fact that by the time many of its doctrines and practices had been adopted by the church so that it was practically absorbed by its rival. And we're going to talk about a couple examples of how Mithraism did get absorbed into Christianity. Two, however, that Dr. King points out. Number one, the Hebrew Sabbath, Sabbath has been abolished by Christians. The church made a sacred day of Sunday, partly because it was the day of the resurrection. But when we observe a little further, we find that the solar festival, Sunday, was the sacred day of Mithra. It is also interesting to note that since Mithra was addressed as Lord, Sunday must have been the Lord's day long before Christian's use. It is also to be noticed that our Christmas, December 25th, was the birthday of Mithra and was only taken in 
the fourth century as the date actually unknown of the birth of Yahusha. This is an important point for us to take away. Any traditions that you practice as a part of Christianity, as a Christian, that is not found in the Bible, you have to question where did it come from? Did this tradition that's not in the Bible just happen organically? Or does it have a root that goes beyond the Christian faith, that goes from other Gentile or pagan religions? And I implore you to do more research on these different traditions because you'll find time and time again, these things did not just happen. It didn't just happen like, oh, we like this idea. Let's just adopt it out of nowhere. Most times these came directly from mystery religions. So let's talk about a couple of more examples. Many of you might wonder, how is it that there is a Pope inside of Catholicism, particularly when we're told not to call anyone father inside of the scripture? Reading from Matthew 23, 9 through 15, do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader. That is Hamashiach, Hamashiach meaning Christ. But the greatest among you shall be your servant. How absolutely contradictory is the Catholic practice of calling someone your father and particularly the Pope, the father of the church. Well, where did this come from? Let's read from this article. It says the Pope, also known as the Bishop of Rome, is considered the spiritual leader and the highest authority in the Roman Catholic tradition. The word Pope is derived from the Latin word Papa, which means father or Pope. On the other hand, the word pater is also the Latin origin and means father. Get this. In Mithraism, the term pater refers to the highest grade or rank in the Mithric priesthood. Mithraism had a hierarchical structure with seven distinct grades or levels with pater being the seventh in the highest grade. Please take note and remember that there are seven grades in Mithraism. We're going to come right back to that. Each grade had its own sets of responsibilities, rituals, and knowledge. The progression through these grades represented an individual's spiritual journey and growth within the Mithric mysteries. The Pater was considered the spiritual leader and authority within Mithraism. They played a central role in conducting rituals and guiding in initiates on their path to spiritual enlightenment. Mithraism was also known for its secretive and elusive nature with the ranks within the priesthood part of an intricate system of initiation and knowledge transmission now i ask you to take note of and remember seven levels of initiation how many sacraments are inside of catholicism seven there's seven sacraments basically levels of initiation inside of catholicism the first being baptism confirmation eucharist the second being or the second or the fourth and fifth being penance and the anointment of the sick, and also the sixth and the seventh, marriage and holy orders. Now I mentioned to you, don't automatically think that because something might sound good that it must come from the church or it must come from uh, Catholicism or Christianity. You might think, well, there's nothing wrong with baptism and, and confirmation and, and all of these things. These are good things. Yes, but when you understand things are being supplanted in order to keep alive a tradition that does not originate in scripture, then you can see that these people are mixing good with bad. And we're told in scripture, what does Yahushua think about when people mix the bad with the good? He says they're lukewarm and he'll spew you out of his mouth. He does not want someone who's half in and half out, someone who's half righteous and half satanic half good and half bad. That's something that he absolutely abhors. You'd be better off just being bad. The Catholic Church would just be better off being 100% pagan rather than trying to take little elements of paganism and mix it in with Christianity or mix it in with the Christian faith. Let's do one more example, and I promise you there are many, but this is one that I think is major. The idea of a church being the place where we go and do everything in regard to our religious duties. This comes from Mithraism, and in Mithraism, there was a temple. The temples were essentially underground caves, and in these caves, there would be different rituals that would be performed. Now, here's something that's very interesting. Inside of this basilica of the San Clement that's inside of Rome, this church is actually built on top of a Mithras temple. And there's other examples of this. This is not just one. There's many examples of when the faiths basically changed. The Romans would take their pagan temples, pagan 
uh, structures and literally convert them into churches. You would think that if they're concerned with a pure and absolute devotion to Yah, that they would not even want to associate themselves with those things. What are we told in scripture whenever Israel would repent? and come back to Yah from their Gentile, Gentile practices, they would burn down things. They would tear down the poles. They would have nothing to do with them. And Yah would have it no other way because he's been very clear. He is a jealous Elohim. Do not try to bring any other gods into the worship of Yah. So this is the true spirit that would have been inhabited if these people were truly devoted to his purpose and to his word. But we can assume or take uh, just note that the fact that they were so willing to mix and outwardly boldly mix their faith with things that are clearly pagan and clearly from the mystery religions, that they were not true adherents. Their heart was not truly given to him. They were not truly seeing the value of dying to themselves and taking on the faith in spirit and in truth. So this is something that you have to always question when people try to act like early Christianity was pure and organic and, and everything was righteous in the way that they assumed or took positions. No, many of these things were borrowed from different religions and, and converted to a new faith that would become Christianity. So let's go back to the central question that this particular segment is on coming out of Christianity, differentiating Christianity from the way, the faith that was practiced in the Bible. When did Christianity become what it is? I would argue that you can make a very clear separation between the attitudes of people before and after a certain individual. His name was Ignatius of Antioch. Now, this person, Ignatius of Antioch, is regarded across the board as a church father, inside of Catholicism, inside of the Protestant movement, pretty much everyone looks at him as a church father. And so we have to look at what is it that this person who was a fine foundational pillar of the Christian faith, what is it that he taught and what is it that he, he did to separate the faith and make it into something that we now see rapidly practiced all over the world. So I'm going to read from a letter that Ignatius wrote. He was Martyr, I believe, somewhere between 108 and the 140 CE. And we don't know exactly when he died, nor exactly when he wrote this letter, but obviously it would have been before he was martyred. So we can say it was in the early second century. So this is the Ignatius letter to Mag the Magnesians, okay? And he says a number of things to them. We're going to start with chapter seven. Do not do anything without the bishop and the prepsters or do nothing without the bishop and the prestors. As therefore the Lord did nothing without the Father, being united to him, neither by himself nor by apostles, neither do ye anything without the bishops and the prestors. Neither endeavor that anything appear reasonable and proper to yourselves apart, but being come together into the same place, let there be one prayer, one supplication, one mind, one hope, and love, and enjoy undefiled. There is one Jesus Christ, than whom nothing is more excellent. Do ye therefore all run together into the temple, into one temple of God, as to one altar, as to one Jesus Christ, who came forth from one Father and is with and has gone to one. So take note, essentially what he's saying in chapter seven, don't do anything without the bishop. Everything that you do, do it as one. We're going to talk about the problems with this. But chapter eight, caution against false doctrines. Do not be deceived with strange doctrines, nor with old fables, which are unprofitable. But if we still live according to the Jewish law, we acknowledge that we have not received grace. For the divinest prophets lived according to Christ Jesus. On this day, they were persecuted, being inspired by his grace to fully convince the unbelieving that there was one God who has manifested himself by Jesus Christ, his son, who is his eternal word, not proceeding forth from silence and who in all things pleased him that sent him. Chapter 9, let us live with Christ. If therefore those who are brought up in the ancient order of things have come into the possession of a new hope, no longer observing the Sabbath, but living in observance of the Lord's day, 
on which also our life has sprung up again by him and by his death, whom some deny, by which mystery we have obtained faith and therefore endure, that we may be found the disciples of Jesus Christ, our only master. How shall we be able to live apart from him, whose disciples, the prophets themselves, and the spirit did wait for him as their teacher? And therefore he whom they rightly waited for, being come, raised them from the dead. In chapter 10, beware of Judaizing. Let us not therefore be insensible to his kindness. For were he to reward us according to our works, we would cease to be. Therefore, having become his disciples, let us learn to live according to the principles of Christianity. For whosoever is called by another name besides this is not of God. Lay aside, therefore, the evil, the old, the sour leaven, and be ye changed into the new leaven, which is Jesus Christ. Be ye salted in him, lest any one among you should be corrupted, since by your Savior ye shall be convicted. It is absurd to profess Christ Jesus and to Judaize, for Christianity did not embrace Judaism, but Judaism Christianity. And so every tongue which believeth might be gathered together to God. What are some central themes that we can take from Ignatius' letter to the Magnesians? Well, number one, hierarchy. The idea that you do nothing without the bishop or the prepsters or the pastors or the ministers. You do nothing without them. What does this contradict? A scripture we just read. Let's read it one more time. Matthew 23, 9 through 15. Do not call anyone on earth your father, for one is your father, he who is in heaven. Do not be called leaders, for one is your leader, that is Hamashiach, but the greatest among you shall be your servant. What is this telling you? There is no person who gets to be a respected person. There are certainly people who are anointed to be in a different position inside of the body, inside of the assembly. There are people who are anointed as prophets. There are people who are anointed as overseers. There are people who are anointed to evangelize. There are people who have different anointings. And by all means, Yah will move those people into the position that he has for them. But the idea that those people are bound to a bishop and the bishop is the hierarchy. So you listen to him. He is your leader. That's a contradiction. We're told that we have one leader, Hamashiach. And so if you think about how many people basically bow to the authority of pastors, and when you, again, look at like a TV Joshua situation, you should watch that documentary. It came out, I think, a month ago, BBC. Crazy, right? People were deferring to this individual, this man, as their leader. Therefore, they would not question him outwardly. They would not come against him. Most would not come against him because he was given this uncanny leeway to do what he wanted. And because of that, not only people actually died, women were raped, uh, horrible abortions, all types of things coming from this one man. Now, let that resonate. What were they doing? They were doing what Ignatius told them to. They were moving according to their head, their leader. They, they were doing nothing without him, okay? This is why so many of us have a problem inside of Christianity because so many of us give our allegiance to individuals where your allegiance should be to one person, to Hamashiach, to Yahusha. That's who your allegiance is to. So that right there is problematic. It creates a hierarchy, a hierarchy situation that we see over and over in the body of Christ. But let's go forward. It says, we do not live in accordance to the Jewish law, but the true word, obviously, the Yahudin law. We don't live according to that. And he even calls the Old Testament law strange doctrines and old fables. So clearly this person has a problem with the Mosaic law, the same one that was written in stone by Yahuwah. He has a problem with that. And so is so, so much the case that he goes again and says, do not follow the Sabbath. Now let's just let take a second to think about this definitive, authoritative statement. He doesn't say, which to me is not even a righteous thing to say, but he doesn't say, follow the Sabbath if you feel led to doesn't say, hmm, well, follow the Sabbath, but, you know, follow some, uh, follow the Lord's day, this new day we're creating. No, he tells people authoritatively, do not celebrate the Sabbath. Do not follow the Sabbath. What do we know about people who tell you not to do Yah's commandments? Let's read Matthew 5, 17 through 20. 
Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly, I tell you, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, not the least stroke of the pen will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. And therefore, anyone who tells you to set aside one of the least of these commands and teaches others accordingly will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever practices and teaches these commands will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. Therefore, I tell you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. Now take note and remember that part about the Pharisees. But let's go back to the central point. What did Yahushua say? If anyone tells you to set aside even one of Yah's commands, that person is least in the kingdom of heaven. And Ignatius, if he is judged to enter the kingdom of heaven, I am not the judge. Many of you probably thinking he ain't, he ain't going to enter heaven. We, know, we don't know. But let's just say he does enter the kingdom of heaven. Based on what Yahushua says, he would be least in the kingdom of, the kingdom of heaven. He told people, do not follow the Sabbath. Do not do this. How absolutely abolical, I mean, how, how is this okay that we accept this as a doctrine that literally contradicts Yahushua? And we call this man a pillar and a church father of Christianity. So let's go on. He also says, do not Judaize. The, the real term would basically be, do not live as the Yahudim. Do not live as the Hebrews. Okay, take note of that. Then he introduces a new faith called Christianity, okay? And he says, Christianity did not embrace Judaism, but Judaism embraced Christianity. So every tongue which believeth might be gathered together to God. And he also says, I don't know if you noticed this, that whoever is called by any other name besides this is not of God. Whoever is called by any other name but Christianity is not of God. So this is a church father, a pillar of Christianity. What is the problem with this? They literally are a pagan culture, the Romans. They're pagans. Like It's everywhere, everyone. Everywhere there are these mystery religions and so many practices, and everyone grows up in it. From growing up in it, they have an understanding, this is how we worship God. This is how God thinks of us. This is how we approach him. This is how we treat him. They have their own understanding. And if you think about the fact that Ignatius is telling these people who come from a pagan religion that have no idea how to approach Yahuwah, um, they're, he's telling them, don't even think about what the what happened with the Jews. That, that's done away with. We're going to now have Christianity. Let's start from a blank slate. Well, they can't start from a blank slate because all of them are bringing their own understandings into the religion. They discovered that the Greeks actually still rule the world. The Greeks are ruling the world from their grave. As a matter of fact, dead men rule the Bahamas. Dead men. Dead men rule America. Dead men. Dead men rule Europe. Dead men. Why? Their ideas are so powerful. They left it after they died. They invented democracy, and it's ruling the whole Western world, including the Bahamas. That's dead men ruling your country. The Greeks believed that you who were born with certain unique traits were automatically leaders. Those who were born without those traits are automatically slaves. So their society was very, very neat. No traits, traits. Slaves, leaders. Let me give you an example, because when I read the traits, I became a little bit sick. One of the traits were, if you were born with a sharp pointed nose, blue eyes, fair skin, fair skin, like white, and thin lips. This is written in their, in their document. You were born to be a leader. And if you weren't born with those qualities, then their conclusion was you were created by the divine gods to be a slave. They believe that. So it doesn't matter what you think about yourself. They would study you and see if you have those natural endowments. If you don't have them, 
it doesn't matter how many degrees you get from college. You are simply an educated slave. So this is serious. So this is the philosophy of the day. So putting on a suit and wearing a tie didn't impress them. You are simply a well-dressed slave. See, some of y'all think that change. That's why I'm getting to it slowly. I'm working my way there. See, some of y'all think that because you came back home with a PhD, that they ain't going to bring the white consultant in and work over you. And you got more degrees. Because somewhere in their twisted mind, they are still sick with Greek thinking. Here's the problem. When the Greeks were invaded by the Romans, the Romans invaded this culture of the Greeks, but the Romans normally would go into a place and, you know, wipe out the place. But when they came to Greece, they saw the beautiful temples, they saw all these gods, and you know, beautiful statues, and then the Romans came to the capital, and they saw the library with all these scrolls, all these writings, I mean, thousands of scrolls, and the Romans were so impressed. Now, the Romans are military guys. They're not into thinking. They're into fighting. So when they came to Greece, they were astonished. They said, you know, no other civilization is like this. So instead of destroying the library, the Romans saved it. And the Romans took the books from the library back to Rome. And the Romans studied and adopted Greek theory of leadership. And the Roman Empire ruled the whole world. Those of you who study history, you know the Romans ruled from Africa all the way up to Scotland. So the Romans ruled the world, destroyed themselves. Now here's the big part. The Roman Empire did not fall by invasion. It fell by disintegration. Disintegration means it fell apart. Like a, you know, like a, a, a piece of, of cake that just broke up in little pieces. I saw the Roman Empire fell apart. Well, you just broke up. And what happened was everybody scrambled for power. And the result was many little kingdoms. Instead of one kingdom, many little kingdoms. Let me give you some of their names. Spanian. Franco. Belger. It was Roman kingdoms. Anglo. Roman kingdoms, Pachuco, Roman kingdoms. We know these kingdoms in English. Franco, France. Belger, Belgium. Porco, Portugal. Anglo, Spanian. They're all kingdoms. They are all Romans. You can get it after I'm gone. <laughs> they are all Romans. So their psyche, their mentality, ingrained. We were chosen by the gods to rule anybody who don't have our traits. They were chosen by the gods to be our servants and our slaves. They are not complete divine beings like us. We are superior so the French and the Spanish and the Portuguese and the British, Anglo, call them Anglo, they decided to expand their kingdoms. So they came to Africa and the Caribbean. And we call it colonization. Colonization is the expansion of Greek leadership philosophy.